in, in Germany. Um, it's actually turned out to be somewhere else, but anyway, we'll 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 just we'll just go with that. Anyway, so we're we're, we're on record, and I want to um, start off with a little bit of an article, and hopefully, it's just me talking on the screen. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Right. Okay. So you you see me now with with my with my wonderful locks. I I do I I I've I've heard that Drina wants to put her fingers through my locks. <laughs> Um, right, so what you I'd said like to you start wouldn't off... say. Oh, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Look, I, 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 I'm so sorry. I, I'm so sorry I even mentioned that. <laughs> um, right, so I, I do believe whoever mentioned this last week, and I excuse excuse me if I'm wrong, but they mentioned about a girl that's half Neanderthal and a half Denisovian. That was Pete. And Right, okay. Uh, now, Pete can jump in here at the end and say it's not the one he's referring to, but I'm going to read this out anyway, because, um, you know, whether Pete's talking about this piece or not, um, it doesn't matter because it's very relevant. Because what we are obsessed with uh, is the couplings between Homo sapiens and Homo sapien Neanderthals. And we look at their offspring. And then we talk about the DNA being mixed and Homo sapien genes are more dominant than the Homo sapien Neanderthals. But then we go on to say that the Neanderthal family has lived on through the modern Homo sapien sapien um, group on the planet. And I'm referring to a group on the planet because when you look at hu humans on the planet, we're all mixed DNA, right? And we're, let's just be clear on that one. So we're looking at a cave in Siberia. That's all we really need to know. And once upon a time, this is a nice little article written by the BBC. Once upon a time, two early humans of different ancestry met at a cave in Russia. Now, I, we, we've already discovered that that's not exactly true, is it? Because what, what is happening is that, that very little of the evidence tells us that people ever lived in caves for any period of time. In fact, most of the evidence to do with our human ancestors is to be found lost. When I say lost, because our landscape has been iced up and you've got these big, big, um, um, uh, you've got glaciation and you've got the movement of ice, it, it, it raises anything out there. So what is out there is to be found in caves, right? So what we can think about is maybe something that I may have mentioned to you last week because I'm getting you guys mixed up with my Thursday morning and Monday morning here. And um, the point I mentioned, oh, I remember we did this. Yeah, we did. Sorry. Um, what we what we discussed last week, if it's still fresh in your brains, is that you may have had a group of um, Homo sapien Neanderthals over there and they were all male. And you may have had a group of Homo sapien over here and you may have had Denisovians over here you may have had another hominid group over here right and what it simply is is making our it is just those groups of people meeting another group swapping individuals and that um, means that that sort of group can continue but the offspring is now going to be half Neanderthal half Denisovian uh, half Homo sapien and so on and so on so uh, this is this is what we mentioned. Just another little bit of a recap on a point that we made last week. And I need I need to really stress this one. I when I when I examined this with my my group of individuals down here uh, and, and we had a chat out. We actually had a class out in the open today, at the, uh, yesterday at the university. and uh, It was great. And um, one of the things I was really, really stressing was that the greatest achievement of humanity from the past is us. For people in the past to create us, they must have been very, very special. They must have been very, very advanced. They they, they tried and tested and they kept um, altering who they are. They had to constantly reinvent themselves. And the greatest example of that is what happened in regards to the flooding of Doggerland. What happened with Doggerland? 
one day people had everything the next day they woke up all they had was the, the, the clothes that they were wearing that's all they had probably losing most of the family members and they either had to go to <clears throat> Europe or they went towards Great Britain and they had to start completely again and those people who started completely again are our ancestors and they must have been so good at starting again and reinventing themselves with all the challenges with 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 all the um evolutionary leaps that they made with with all the inventions with all the civilized ways that they came up with with the sense of being industrialist human beings they 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 eventually developed into us and i think the greatest achievement is that they are better than us they they are much better people in the past are much better in surviving things than we are we're not going to go down that little rabbit warren and go with examples saying that humans have really failed in the past three years you know exactly what i'm talking about we don't need to go down that rabbit hole but what we need to say is that alongside crossbreeding human beings hominids the greatest achievement is that they survived and they developed and they gave us us today we can shout about concord we can shout about going to the moon we can shout about computers we can shout about all these things but the argument I always use is that in 1914, we were stupid enough to enter a war that, that took away all the human peaceful achievements that we had ever made up, up until 1914. That's how good and developed we are as human beings today. But in the past, they couldn't afford to kill each other. They couldn't afford to wipe each other out. They couldn't afford to go um, at war with each other. They needed to move on and continue. And this is the legacy of the past, which is a far stronger legacy than, than we ever will be, unless we solve our differences and stop killing each other. And I'm not going to go into a Martin Luther King speech either, but it's sounding like that. So once upon a time, two early humans of different ancestry met somewhere in Siberia, Russia. Some 50,000 years later, Scientists have confirmed that they had a daughter together. Nice, nice. But these, the couplings are of a Denisovian and a Homo sapien Neanderthal. DNA extracted from the bone fragments found in the cave show the girl was the offspring of a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovian father. Denisovians were very similar to Neanderthals in many ways. But then again, we are very similar to Neanderthals as well. And so were Homo sapiens very similar to Neanderthals. In fact, even saying that we're similar is a nonsense statement because it goes without saying. So what we found in 2018 was that with a report through Nature magazine, it gives a, it gives a rare insight into the lives of our closest ancient human relatives. Do we call them relatives? Or do we call them paths along our family tree? Neanderthals, as we properly call them today, and Denisovians, were humans like us, but belong to different species. Is that true? Let's not get distracted by that. We knew from previous studies that Neanderthals and Denisovians must have occasionally had children together, as much as Homo sapiens had children with Denisovians and Neanderthals and whatever human beings were out there. The writer of this said, but I never thought that we would be so lucky as to find an actual offspring of these two distinct groups. Present day non-African humans have a small proportion of their DNA that comes from Neanderthals. We always talk about that. Some other non-African populations, depending on where they live, also have a fraction of the DNA that comes from an Asian people known as Denisovians. Denisovians seem to be very dominant within the Asian landscape. The fact that the genes have been passed down the generations show that interbreeding must have happened. It did happen without doubt. I don't think we should be in any doubt now that making the statement that Neanderthals never became extinct. We can't doubt that statement. They never become extinct. They're, they're within us today. 
and so are the Denisovians, and so are whatever other hominids that existed at that time. They're still around as well. However, the only known site where, where we've got evidence of Denisovians and Neanderthals has been found in a cave in Siberia, in the Atal Mountains of Siberia, north of Mongolia. Furthermore, fewer than, 30, fewer than 20 so-called um, so-called of these sort of hominids, 20 so-called early hominids. Um, we, we've got so little evidence. We've got 20 examples. We've got so little evidence from, from that distance in time. So it's just trying to build up that, that pool and understanding of our ancestry, mixed, mixed ancestry. Studies have taken into account and you start to get a picture that over all our evolutionary history, humans, humans, we always mixed with each other. Which changes things deeply. Which brings together another question that's never ever answered. What about all those other creatures, all those Australopithecines that are said to become extinct in Africa? hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, did they actually continue within our DNA pool? Did they become extinct? Did any of our human ancestors actually truly become extinct? That's a very interesting question, but we're not gonna answer that today. We're talking about 100,000 years onwards to our present moment in the history of the planet. When and where did Neanderthals and Denisovians live? We know that they lived across that landscape of Eurasia and Asia. We do know that the two groups of our hominid relatives lived in amongst each other alongside Homo sapiens 40,000 years ago. Neanderthals migrated eastwards. They may have encountered Denisovians at times as well as early modern humans. Neanderthals and Denisovians may not have had many opportunities to meet. We said that last week. The opportunity to meet is the moment to either procreate, to change and move on different ideas, to make a difference. One point I did make last week, and I've got to be very clear on this. Even if home human groups didn't always meet each other. And when they did meet each other, it didn't mean to say that they relied upon skills and ideas. They didn't rely upon those skills and ideas to be passed on. They just needed to pass on human beings. Because the example I've given you earlier on is that human beings are adaptable. They don't need outside influences. We can just do things with complete independence from other groups. But one thing that we are dependent upon is mixing that blood pool. And we, that's more important than anything else. The example of this is as follows. People in Central America were able to build pyramids at the same time that they built them in Egypt, at the same time they beat them, built them in Mesopotamia, at the same time they built them in the Indus Valley, the same time that they built, built them in Indonesia. That was all independent human thought. But what we did need is the exchange of human bodies to make sure that our blood pool remains mixed and evolves. But when did they, they when, when they did meet, this article confirms, they must have mated frequently, much more so than we previously thought. When, when, we, when we look again next week, we look at the Gibraltar cave child, a, a cross coupling of Homo sapien, sapien, and Homo sapien Neanderthal. So in other words, the genes of Homo sapiens sapiens had already developed, but you've got Homo sapiens and sapiens and Homo sapiens Neanderthals crossbreeding. And you've got this, this individual, this skeletal remains at, at uh, a cave in Gibraltar, Gibraltar cave. What do we know about this one girl that we're talking about? And what we're going to do, we're going to bring in Pete. Was this the, was this the one you were talking about, Pete? 
I can't hear Pete. He's talking to the ghosts. Yeah, it was about the, the girl, and it was about, apparently found in Germany. They found this girl's arm, and they realized that the DNA was a mixture of both the uh, Neanderthal and the uh, hominids. Right, what, what we're going to do, I, I'm going to, after this, after I've done this, Pete, we're going to still try and track that down, right? There was another article a little while ago about the DNA of people in far eastern Russia and far western North America and to find very, very similar strains between those. So this is what we're talking about now. Yeah. So um, The only, the Pete, only uh, people in America are immigrants. <laughs> Sorry, Pat. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we, we've got this girl's bone, Germany. Yep. I've obviously been looking at the wrong thing. Girls from Germany, uh, knee and Gerthel. Let's see if I can get that. I've been looking at the wrong thing. Uh, but, but, uh, hang on. I've always, uh, I've always maintained that people melded together. And it's, uh, uh, bingo, bingo, Pete. I've got it. Um, yeah. I got it, Pete. It, it's the, um, this is another one. Hang on a minute. Hang on, I'm just gonna look at this in a minute. No, this is no, this is the this is the Siberian one still. Hang on. Um hmm. so it was ne Neanderthal and human, yeah? Yeah. In Germany. Yep. And a, a girl's arm bone. Okay, we're going to see if we can... Right, girl's arm bone. Yeah. And you say this was really recent? Yeah, it came in about... Oh, just less than a week ago, it came in. 2022. Mm, I have been trying to search for this. Hang on a minute. Uh, Well, you're going to have to try and find that one, Pete. I can't find it. Okay. I can't find it. Okay. You're going to have to, get, you're going to, have to dig, dig up one out, Pete. Right. Yep. Carry, carry on what we were saying. Right. So what do we know about the girl and her family from Siberia? The girl's story has been pieced together from a single fragment of bone found in a Denisovian cave by Russian archaeologists several years ago. It was brought to Leipzig for gen genetic analysis. Pete, I think, yeah, it's been analysed in Germany. It might be the same ah, one. That. Uh, that's, yeah. There we fact, are. That's, we've nailed it, Pete. That's it. Yeah, fair enough. Good. So the, the fragment is part of a long bone. So are we talking about the um, 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 femur? Oh, not the femur, the, the humerus. The humerus or humerus, the, humerus, 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 or the, humerus. Or the uh, tibia. Arm bone, humor, humerus, yeah. It says it's a long bone, so it's humerus. Yeah. Um, and we can estimate that this, this individual was at least 13 years old. Interesting that. So she survived yeah. till she was 13. So, so the yeah. coupling worked. The researchers deduced that the girl's mother was genetically closer to Neanderthals who lived in Western Europe than to Neanderthal individuals who lived earlier in a Denisovian cave. So what we're talking about is various different waves of Neanderthals going into Siberia. This shows that the Neanderthals migrated between Western and Eastern Europe and Asia tens of thousands of years um, before 50,000 years ago. Um, genetic tests also revealed that the Denisovian father had at least one Neanderthal ancestor further back in his family tree. So what we're talking about with all of this is it seems it seems that um, it, it, it does it does very much seem that um, you know we, we've got we've got mixing of hominids um, and they, they 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 seem to keep mixing. Um, I seem to have missed Mister um, Mister a little bit here. So um, so is everyone uh, part Neanderthal? Well, this is what we're saying. Um, when 
we're, we're talking about where where these people lived. Um, so so that basically answers that. It was it was analysed in Leipzig University, uh, Pete. Um, and what was what we're saying by this? If if you analyse this piece, we're talking about waves of Neanderthals going into Asia, Siberia. <coughs> Denis, Den, um, this cave known it's known as um, Denisovian cave, and that was one wave. And then they come across other hominids and they they interpret. And then another wave comes through more Neanderthals or Homo sapiens. They interbreed. So the evidence tells us that it's not one-off breeding, it's constant breeding. So it looks like, it looks very, what, what, right, the point I'm trying to make is this. We, we think about purebred, let's talk about, um, let, let, let's, let's talk about pure things. We talk about purebred Neanderthals and purebred um, Homo sapiens out of Africa, right? There's a coupling and they create a half child between the two groups. All the evidence is telling us that there's constant breeding between these groups. Um, so it's never a one off thing. It's a constant thing. So it's very likely that after a certain period of time, there are no longer pure Homo sapien Neanderthal groups and there are no longer pure Denisovian groups and there are no longer pure Homo, homo sapien groups. It's constant interbreeding. Now that leads us with another problem. And th this, is, this is quite revolutionary. Was there ever a point that pure Homo sapien Neanderthals actually left Africa? Was there ever a point that ho a pure Homo sapiens ever left Africa? The answer is probably not. They, they were interbreeding with different groups as they went along. And that is a more important point than anything. So it's of no surprise that we've got this DNA within us. And the other thing as well is, is that when we identify tools from Neanderthal groups, those are actually tools from a mixed group. When we find tools from a Homo sapien group, it's clearly that they are also from a mixed group as well. The problem is what we what we do as human beings is talk about this puerile thing. You know, we're pure white people or we're pure black people, right? And that is absolute nonsense. Yeah. It's pure nonsense. Because my my mother, for example, has okay, Pete, I'm gonna come out with it um live here, right? Um my, my, my granddad had a relationship with a woman from South Africa, Bill, and they had a child that my granddad never ever saw again. And that was my, that was my mum's um, half sister. And we've only found this out now. My mum, on the other hand, has got very dark hair and she's got a blood group that clearly comes from Africa. So in other words, um, I'm partly half caste and I don't have a problem with that. But there's no, there's no big deal with that. We've, 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 this, is, this is part of our DNA makeup, makeup. It's no big deal. And this is what I say, you know, when we, look, when we looked at Goff's cave, I've said there's no big deal what color skin this individual is. What is important is who these people are and what they did with the body and, and their survival and to be able to put the body in the cave in the first place. This is what was important. So what we're gonna, what we're gonna do now, we're gonna show you an image and, and somebody, somebody mentioned, oh, hang on a minute. It would help if I uh, if I started sharing, wouldn't it? Sharing is caring. People's going to loan me his uh, car when I'm driving around Barry, uh, um, because he's he's a caring, sharing man. I'll take it down that lane, Pete. Right. Okay. Here we go. 
Okay, let's uh, let's enlarge this. Now that's a really interesting image. Okay, um, and what 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 we're gonna what we're gonna do now? We're gonna look at Swanscombe, but we need to show you where Swanscombe is. So if we go back to here, oh, that skull is that yeah. got sort of altered in any way, or is that the actual thickness of the bone? That's the thickness of the bone. It's uh, Andy, really what, what, thick, what, isn't it? It did look very thick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we, this, this is why I want to show you a map a minute. We're, mm. we're going to... Um, right. Swan, swans come. And oh. I wanted to show you the location a minute. So... Oh, technology. Swans come there. Um, map. Okay. So here we go. What we've got is... Oh. Hang on, Hi. move in, move in. There, there, right, there's Swanscombe. Oh. Um, and there's the River Thames. Yes, oh, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, as far so... as I... Yeah. Uh, Trina! Can you it? Oh, you God. It? Oh, no, Trina. We're getting your yeah. conversation. Okay. Don't, don't worry, Trina. We'll wait for you a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on a minute. Okay, good. Then. All right. Yeah. Bye. You, you probably can mute her, Carl. I, yeah, but unfortunately, you mute it's too me. Late. How dare you? Margaret's what? internet's gone off. I thought it was Margaret. No, Margaret's internet's not working. Oh. oh. Why did she uh, come over to you? Call was. Right. Why did she come over to your place? <laughs> Oh, there's an Go idea. On, get over. Oh, Tell to bring a cake. through the damn yeah. thing so we can see where it is. Cakes and biscuits. <laughs> right, so so there we we got basically we've got um, Swanscombe and the, and the green one alongside is is basically Ebbsfleet, and we we well no actually Ebbsfleet is it there we go, we do actually mention Ebbsfleet, so we got south of the River Thames, um and we've sort of got going all the way. Um, out to the uh, Dart, Dartford Tunnel there. So we've got Swanscombe. Now that's where we are. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to the skull, right? And I tell you what, uh, Gina. Yes? It wasn't me who said to me, you honestly, it was Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, I, I really like stirring it. Right, okay, what I'm, what I'm going to do is that... Um, you know what? What what I'm going to do? Last week, I, I I read, in part from a book by the National Trust called Prehistoric and Roman Britain, um, and this book itself, when we, when we looked at some of the stuff from last week, um, this had originally been published in 1983, and most of the stuff that we discussed in this book last week hasn't changed including the statement made in here. Uh, I did actually have it last week, but I can't remember where it is. But it did actually mention in here um, that it's very, very likely that um, humans are a coupling of various different um, hominids. And it was saying this back in 1983. We, we've struggled to sort of, you know, believe that. But, you know, this is what was being said in the 1980s, and we, we still sort of doubt it. Um, so we've sort of established that anyway. Uh, what it says about Swanscombe, th this in Swanscombe, it goes as follows. S Swanscombe overlooking the south bank of the River Thames, close to where the Dartford Tunnel disgorges its constant thunderous um, cavalcade. Oh, look at those words there. Is one of the last places in the world where one would expect to meet and contemplate man, the ancient hunter. Good wording there. Not that the gorge is it's um, um, constant, um, but it was here on the gravels of the 30 meter river terrace that the dentist, an amateur fossil hunter, A. Marston discovered a famous cranial fragment in 1935. Later, 
and almost incredibly, we'll talk about that information about this individual. I want to see if we can see if there's anything changed between 1983 and now. Later, and almost incredibly, two more fragments were discovered belonging to the same skull. One of, one of the, right, Marston found two, and uh, somebody else found another one. So we'll look at that in a moment. The face is missing, but a brain capacity of 1,325 is implied. And Margaret's back. Oh, oh hang on a minute. I, I, I'm actually Andy. I'm gonna I'm gonna make you um I, I I'm gonna make you share thingamajig because I have to go keep doing this. Uh, if people got to leave, so Andy, I'm gonna make you um co thingy. Yeah, good. Andy's co-host. Roger, you no, I don't want to make Roger a co-host. <laughs> he wouldn't have a clue what he's doing. But. Sorry, sorry, Rod. There you go. Right, okay. So back to what we were talking about. Right, okay. And back to that image. Right, where were we? Right, good to, good to have you joining us again, Margaret. So um, so the brain capacity is, is only slightly less than the modern average. The remains are thought, to, thought by some to represent a sort of prototype Homo sapien sapien and by others to be an early Neanderthal individual. So nobody can really understand if this is a Neanderthal or a Homo sapien, because they're too close. It was originally called Swan's Man, but later on, because of the bone structure, they referred to it as Swan's Woman. And the date given in this book um, is that Swan's Woman, it is dating back to 1983, the date given lived around 200,000 years ago during a period which is separated from our post-glacial times by two major glaciations and the warmer interglacial between them. So we're talking about 200,000 years ago when it was a little bit warm. Experts do not agree whether she lived in the cooling closing stages of an interglacial period or in a shorter, warmer interlude or interstadial. We know what interstadial means, don't we? A warm period. Oh, and by the way, I've been working on that sheet, by the way. You all wanted a sheet. I've been working on it and I've... Um, and, and I'm, I'm part way to completing it. So the climate, the climate at the time seems to have been temperate, but chilly. And the woman must have belonged to a hunting band who favored an open grassy river plain setting that was flanked by birch, pine and alder forest. Now stop a minute, stop. This was actually found in a gravel bed, not, not in a cave. So obviously proof that people are out there hunting and not just living in caves or associated with the caves. Wild deer, horses and cattle seem to have been the preferred prey, but also present in the area were now extinct animals such as straight tusked elephant, rhinoceros and the cave lion. So that's the other evidence they found. It is also possible that England at this time was home to more than one species of, of humanoid. Mm. Talking about Homo erectus. We, know, we don't mention Homo erectus, it's almost as if they're very backwards, but Homo erectus were much taller and they had much thicker bone structure than Homo sapien Neanderthals. But there's no reason uh, that our human ancestors um, didn't marry, uh, didn't get sort of integrate with them. Although the Lady of Swanscombe has proved, uh, uh, has provided us with the oldest known British skull, the evidence for human occupation goes back much further as we know and as we have found, um, looking at Haysborough, um, dating back nearly a million years and um, um, the likes of Boxgrove as well, um, half a million. So, so what we're gonna do now is I would like us to read out what it actually says in regards to um, Swanscombe woman on my other notes. So what I'd like to do I would like to press that and I would like to sort of scroll through some of these images. Um, so you've got um, the parietal bone, which is, which, and look at that there. They're saying that this dates to 400,000 years ago. It's the same skull, a distance of 200,000 um, 200, years. There we go. There, there, there it is. That's as it is. That's looking at it from a back. So, that's the octopal uh, bone, the, the one at the back, and these are the parietal bones, the one on the left and the right. And then what you then would have, um, if we sort of go off that, 
Should be an image coming up now. Hang on. Off. Um, and there should be a little image here. Hang on. Hang on. Where is it showing? Hang on. If we type in Swan Sim Skull Plan, I did have this. Just trying to get this to work. Um, plan, enter. Um, it should actually show it. Right, okay, it's not sure coming up on this, but what we what we do have on site is that they, there's a nice little um, plaque on site marking where this was found as well. Swanscombe Skull Site. Um, and there, that's basically how big the whole thing is together. So I'm going to mention that that's basically where the, the spinal column comes through at the back. That's that hole. So what we're going to do now is... I'm going to um, let us um, try to understand this a little bit further. There's a lovely story associated with this. And what we will do is I, I've just realized that there's some really good images on Wikipedia, right? And, and they're, they're really nice ones. So we're going to go to Wikipedia now um, and then we're going to type that Swanscombe. Actually, to be honest with you, I can't fault lots of the images on Wikipedia. As a source, it can be quite dodgy sometimes. But what we've got, we've got some nice images. So if we, uh, if we type in that there and we go to the images, uh, Swanscombe Heritage Park, there we go. And then the images nicely come up. And that... There's, there's, there's like a little sort of place showing you where the skull was found. It's great. And, um, and these, these are some of the other artifacts that have actually been found there, which, which, is, which is fascinating. We don't often see artifacts, but... So what, what they've got since the discovery, they've established a nearly 10-acre geological park in Swanscombe. So if nobody's ever heard of it, there's a 10-acre park east of London called Swanscombe Heritage Park. And it's a site of special scientific interest. It contains a geological conservation reserve and a, a, a national nature reserve and a gravel pit, which is at Swanscombe, known as the Barnfield Pit, which is where these remains came from. And in a way, the story of this is actually quite sad. So we, we've, got, we've got the wonderful tools there. Um, and and these, these were actually found by Marston. And if I'm, if I'm gonna analyze this right, um, let's, just, let's just see if I've got a pointer I can cheat. Right, it's not, okay, we're gonna do an ID on these stones. That one on the right is flint. That one on the top is chert. And that one looks like a shale stone, which has been made into an axe, which is very interesting. That doesn't come into Chalcedony, Flint, Chert. Um, that looks like it's that there. That looks like a like um, I don't know, like a like a shale. Hmm. Anyway, so these are some of the and, and the story, the story when I say is quite sad. We'll leave them there a minute. I've got a mammoth tooth to show you. We go to 1935. The area was already known for the finds of numerous hand axes from the Paleolithic period, dating back to 400,000 years ago. Now, the dates differ from what's in this book. And I don't know why that is. Maybe they redated the evidence and it makes the human remains found there 200,000 years older than what's in this book. And can we stop? And the reason why we're going to stop is I want to talk about something else. <laughs> Last night, most of my students down here were away because it was bank holiday. 
and I was left with a with a small core of my my youngest my youngest people. Um, and what what I what I actually said to them was that don't get too obsessed with dates. And I basically said the detail is more important than the dates. But then I said, I'm going to slightly correct myself at the same time. I said, if you've got a date like AD 43, that's the date that we start the Roman era. And we can't disagree with that. But it wasn't suddenly the Roman era overnight. In fact, Roman influence did not spread across the whole of Britain. Even in parts of southern England, there were little roundhouses still standing hundreds of years after Roman influence is said to have been complete. So by giving dates and times to periods is not helpful. The detail is helpful. And how the detail is arranged is also not helpful. Because people change and alter. They go back on technology. They move technology forward. For example, Andy, it has to come up again. Gold. As we know, most of the tribes in southeastern England. And one second, I'm going to give Baldrick a biscuit. Baldrick, lovely. There you go. Nice Baldrick biscuit. Yeah, well. Um. Ba ba basically, um, do you know, I blow my head there. Hang on. Can somebody remind me what I was just about to say before I chuck Baldrick his biscuits? Somebody? Are you there? Yeah, we're there, but we're not sure what you were going to say. What did I just say before that? You were on about the, uh, the actors. Dates and arrangements and... Uh, and, the yeah. principles oh, are more gold, gold. It was yeah. gold. I was going to say you were talking about gold, but yeah, that's the, that's mm. the one. Sorry, it was Baldrick. He distracted me. My <coughs> and, um, anyway, I, I this is one thing I said last night. I said um, roughly from about 100 years BC, coins started to sort of circulate within southeastern England, and by about just before Julius Caesar started his plan to invade Britain in 56 BC. Coins in Britain showed images. They weren't good images, and eventually they had lettering on them. But they were gold coins and silver coins and potin coins, which is a bit of an alloy coin. And the point I made last night was if you had a tribe, say, in Cornwall, and you would, you went to a tribal person in Cornwall and said, oh, by the way, can I buy a, chick a chicken with these gold coins? The person in Cornwall might turn around and say, I'm not interested in gold. We've got copper. We actually produce bronze axes. We don't want your gold. Right? And the point I'm trying to make is that the detail is important, but not how it's arranged. It's what people did with artifacts in the past is important. What people did with these axes is important. Coins were not necessarily circulated because they had a monetary value. They may have just been circulated because they looked good. Did any of these axes so show signs that they were actually used? But they were created by our ancestors. So let's not get obsessed with the fact that these were used as axes. What we need to get obsessed with is that they're time signs of a wonderful, innovative past, which is far more diverse than we could ever give it credit for. The year is 1935-1936. Work at Barnfield Pit uncovered within those two years two fragments a fossilized humanoid skull. These two fragments came to be known 
as the remains of Swanscombe Man, but were later found to have belonged to a young woman. The Swanscombe skull has been identified by most as Neanderthal and does not date to 200,000 years ago, as we mentioned earlier on, but does in fact date to around 400,000 years ago. But that date is not important. It's not. What is important is that people lived in Britain 400,000 years ago, whatever hominid they are. The skull fragments were found in the lower middle terrace gravels at a depth of almost eight meters. Let's, let's examine that again. And what I am going to do is I'm going to move this turkey. Roger, you've been a very naughty turkey. Very naughty turkey. And you're making lots of noise. And you're going to go to bed. No, stop the you can see the link with Baldrick and gold. It's that Norfolk gold thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thought I'd say that when he wasn't here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Been eating his biscuits, I think. <laughs> they look more like hammers than axes to me. Uh, Pete. Yeah, they, they do look like axes to you, however. No, the hammers, I said, rather than axes. Oh, right, that's good. I, I like it. I like mm. what you're saying. But whether they're a hammer or an axe, Peter, yeah, well, whatever, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean they were to tools. say they were ever used. They were tools, yeah, they were tools and axes, mm. whatever they are, whatever they are, folks, they were created mm. by our ancestors. This is the key point. Now, Did what we have... were saying, oh, sorry, go on. Did they have fire? Uh, back then can we can we um you've taken us down another rabbit hole which we mentioned last week <laughs> the, the rabbit hole that we mentioned last week was that however our human groupings are put together how our human tree is more com what i'm trying to say what i have been saying is our human tree is much more complicated Right. And what, what we're going to do, we're going to get the little, uh, Margaret, you shouldn't have said anything. You're a very <laughs> naughty girl. Uh, because we're going to get the scribble board on, right, to look at two things, right, to try and make this a little bit more evolutionary. Right, we're going to get this little board on you. We're going to share a white whiteboard. There we go. We're going to do this. Right. So what we're going to talk about is that we're going to say, we're going to say, right. Now, fire coming down from a tree, um, bipedal, okay, um, um, eating meat. What people usually do, they say, right, what comes first, right? Did we actually, did we actually come, we, we obviously came down from a tree and we started walking upright and then we started eating meat and we had to cook that meat on a fire. But the thing is, maybe, and this is this is very important, maybe, so if we if we if we scribble all that out, right? Let's scribble all that out, clear drawings. Maybe people remained walking on all fours, but they started making fires and they started eating meat. And then they become bipedal. Or what could have happened is that they um, they started they started um, making fires and then they started eating meat. Right. What I'm trying to say. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that there is no clear family. There is no clear line to our human evolution. You can never do that. You can't do that. There's no way forward. Right. Because it's not that simple. What I would have expected... Pete, 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 can you keep that a minute? Yeah. Please keep that. Keep that a minute, but don't lose what you're going to say. What you expect, I want that in, but not now, right? I'm just, just yeah, try okay. and get through this, right? Okay. So um, what what we need to look at is this. Let's, let's try... What I'm trying to do is complicate archaeology and make it so simple. When, when you complicate it and then you say anything's possible... That's when things are simple, right? So in Britain, for example, right? If 
the Romans had never, ever invaded Britain in AD 43, right? What would have happened was that eventually towns would have developed. It's quite possible that the first town in Britain would have been Caliva Atrobatum, Atrobatum, which was actually uh, being developed as a town before the Romans ever came to Britain. They would be an influence to build a town. And even without that in influence, towns would have been developed because population would have increased. And when population is increasing, people start to live in towns. That is a fact. The other thing I would like to make is, th is this. What we are saying now is that by the time people left Africa, they were this human group, this human group, this human group, all these interactions of human groups. So by the time they come out of Africa, it was such a mix match of human groups, such a huge mix match of DNA that the people leaving Africa were already mixed race before they actually ever come to us. And this is what we're saying. Because as, as these Neanderthals come along, they see, a, they see a nice little Denisovian. And they say, oh, right, do you want to come with our tribe? That's fine. Do, do you want one of the Neanderthals to actually go in your Denisovian tribe? Yeah, we'll do that. And then they come across a homo sapien group. So by the time they come out of Africa, they're already in Europe mixed. So what, what we are looking at is that things are very, very complicated, much more complicated than we can ever give it. So whenever you see a human tree that goes, this is what the human tree goes like, right? They say, right, we had Neanderthals, they became extinct. And we, you, we are Homo sapiens sapiens. We now know that Neanderthals never become extinct. In other words, this is what happens. Everything diverges into one human species, which we are today. And that can never change because you will always, you will always now have mixed people breeding. This is what the human race is going to be. Um, you're never ever going to have pure Chinese people or pure Japanese people or pure Western people. It's not what happens. And you can see how this has happened. Peter, over to you. You need the whiteboard, Pete. No, no, not particularly, no. Um, where you were talking about uh, the needing to uh, cook the meat, what I believe is that they were, were eating meat, but then they come across an animal which had been in a fire and found it so much easier to eat and so much tastier that from that point on, they said, oh, well, it's, we, we should eat, treat our meat with meat. And uh, have it cooked. That's pretty. And that's the way they, they would have decided then, oh, well, cooked meat is better. Or even better, Pete. They were all sat around the family fire and they chucked a bit of meat on there. It's the same thing. Well, no, I would have thought they'd come across an animal which had been burned. That's and as easy. they were all hungry, they decided to eat the burned animal. Found actually, how much Pete, here it was. Actually, Pete, we're going to go even further than that, right? You don't need to. You don't need to burn. You don't need to put um, meat on a fire. Like right? in the hot deserts of Africa, um, the the animal becomes desiccated. Oh, yeah, it's very similar. To, it's very similar to cooking, right? Yeah. Uh, but it tastes quite. It's quite. It, this, this is um, uh, this is this is um, beef jerky. How beef jerky is made, isn't it? It it, it dried yeah. out, right? You think it's cooked, but it's not. It's just dried out. Yeah. Uh, the moisture's be, taken out. Could be some forest, forest fires, Carl. Mm. You know, when they were yeah. regular, so that mm. probably, and you'd soon find carcasses. As you say, there's, if you want there's... food, you try that, and suddenly, as you said by accident, oh, that's nice. This it's little, because there have been plenty chances to see bird meat, don't you think? Yeah, in fact, Roger, there's loads of formulas, right? Do you, do you know, do you know Pete, Pete will understand this, right? I think we all do. If you um, you can't eat raw crab because it's just liquid, right? You you got to boil right. crab, and and then the flesh is created, right? You break right. open a, a crab's leg and it's and it, you know it's just died, right? Yeah. It it's crap, my my yeah. French, right? Mm. Now, that's an interesting mm. one, Pete. This this is why I'm saying your idea of finding carcasses in a woodland and Roger I'll go with that but I'll also go with animals being found dead in the sun I'll go with that um, you, can you accidentally find crabs burned um, and you need somewhere along the line they decided to boil them 
you might find them on a rock where they've been exposed to the sun that you're talking about and they had actually become cooked in that way we can do that pete we're going to do that yep. we're going to let that we're going to do that so so yeah. what i'm saying right last week some of you went away and you said oh this was too complicated right but it's not complicated because what we're doing is we're saying lots of your answers are correct it's just it's been overcomplicated. Yeah. <coughs> lobsters nowadays we boil them alive Ooh. horrible mm. they scream as they go into the boiling water that's enough pete sorry right <laughs> yeah they do and I, I think that's terrible to be honest with you but but what do they say what do they say pete um uh, lobsters <laughs> and oysters if they're dead you can't eat them Oh, they, they, oh, yes. They, they yes, don't that's right. They don't scream. It's the air coming out of them. They haven't got yeah. any ability to make a noise. Mm. And what if they could? Well, the oysters, I picked off the rocks and ate them there and then. Simple as that. Mm. They yeah. must have. They must have been terribly sick eating raw meat, don't you think? They must have had a terrible <laughs> stomach ache. They <laughs> well have had. Perhaps they felt a lot better eating cooked meat that killed all the bacteria. Actually, actually can we, can we, can, right, this, this, this like is the steak? same. Uh, raw, you like it raw? Uh, rare, 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 raw, rare, rare. raw. Um, the, the, one, the one thing is, the one thing is this, right? One thing that we can all associate with is allergies to milk, right? Now, um, we're not we're lactose intolerant as humanoids right we, we can't really take other animals milk but we do right we're not tolerant of other animals milk naturally right how did that happen so the first people that drank other animals milk were sick mm. so why did we keep drinking it and um mm. there are there are people, um, I do believe, in um, <laughs> Asia that if you give them alcohol, it'll kill them, right? So how do we build up these tolerances? And it's, it's again, it's a lot more complicated. Um, Isn't it a fact that the uh, man had his goat's milk in a, in a bladder and he'd been out all cheese. day and he went to drink his goat's milk, but it had turned into cheese. And he really And, and liked cheese is going to be... Yeah, cheese is going to be more di cheese is going to be more digestible uh, than milk. Yeah, yeah, you're very right. You're very right. Um, what 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 we're gonna what we're gonna do now? Um, I said that I we we haven't finished Swanscombe, and what we're gonna do after Swanscombe is we're gonna do Pont Newith, and then we're gonna call it a day if if you don't mind. But we we'll have a uh, we'll have a couple of minutes break because I just want to make sure the animals are in bed. Um, and, and Baldrick was really upset because with Queenie, he, he, his, his Queenie wasn't um, with him. So I'm going to get Queenie from under the shed. And I tell, I tell you what, guys, I tell you what, this, 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 this is this, right? Um, if any of you ever come down here, right? I, I've got to inject my an animals with 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 drugs, man, and they trust me to do it. <laughs> so. You know, the thing is, you've got to burn these afterwards because otherwise you get people going, oh, so you go, Mr. Langford for Turkey Baldrick. <laughs> so any, anyway, so um, crack on. So let, let's let's look. We, we had those artifacts. It's Margaret's fault. Margaret completely. You know, I tell you what, Margaret is so disruptive today. She is. She is. She has, she's. In. Um, I've had to go off and let her back on. Oh, she's been a very naughty girl. But <laughs> Margaret asked a very Margaret asked a very sensible and important question. So uh, let's let's we, we had this image, didn't we? Are you still there, Margaret? Yes, I'm still here. You were a very naughty girl, but that was a really good question you asked, and uh, it, it let let Pete put in his bit as well. So that was great. So um, so here we go. Um, if we go back again. Now, go back, go back, go back. Okay, skull fragments. Hang on, there's a, there's the tooth. Oh, hang on. 
Well, hang on, there's, 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 uh, where's the, oh, the skull, anyway, we'll, 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 we'll talk about, we'll talk about this, hang on, and what I want to do um, is, if you can bear with me, um, and we'll go back to that, um, and we'll go to um, skull, we'll get the skull on there. <laughs> and there's the optical bone and basically there is how it would be um we could i did add the reconstruction then didn't i hang on mm. oh swings come on hang on we, we had a skull reconstruction hang on bear with me a minute folks keep let me losing this every single time where is it? We'll go with that one there. That'll do. Oh, there. Bingo. That's what I wanted. That's the skull. So the front part of the skull's gone. So what, what we've got, we've got three sections found. Um, and it says, right. So th this is what I felt was really interesting about this. There was this, um, by the way, he was a dentist, Claire. So dentist Alvan Marston took it upon his, himself in 1935, blindly, because other artifacts had been found, but blindly dug eight metres into the gravel. To, uh, eight metres, he dug eight metres into the gravel. On his days off, he dug eight metres into the gravel. Um, and I think he was, I think he was the age of 47 when he did this, right? Which is, which is some, which is my age. Um, Marston, amateur archaeologist, don't like that term, visited the pit to find um, flint tools, but he kept digging and he found a piece of the skull. Mm. And he found, he found another piece of the skull as well. And actually, what I've got here is there is another story that I want to see if it's here a minute hang on a minute there's another there's another little story because you used to take your son along with him and uh, i'm just going to see if i can get this one up here in a minute so we got um, two bits of the parietal bone which are the bits um facing the front of the skull um and you've got the um 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 occipital bone which is the one that carries the spine and i'm just trying to i'm just trying to get this other thing on you um and it's there's another little bit of a story that mentions his son which i don't seem to have a minute which i'm just waiting for right hang on a minute all oh, right here we go right okay a little bit more information yeah i like this is the one i wanted to read i got I had the wrong one so so it was on saturday the 29th of, of june 1935 Marston, the dentist, um, was excavating and he, he was excavating and he found what, what, a, a, what he thought was a bit of bone sticking out. Um, who's talking, Rog? Good. It's Pete. No, not Pete. It's Rog. No. But anyway, there was a bit of bone no. sticking out. There was a bit of bone sticking out, and on closer inspection, he realised it was human. And he realised it was the base of the skull at the back, the um, occipital bone, which carries the spine. So he, he, he clearly found a piece of human bone, that big piece at the back there. And despite the possibility of subsequent controversy over its position, he realized he couldn't leave it where it was. So mark the spot. And what we're talking about, he was worried that it would be seen as another dodgy find like Piltdown Man forgery. By the 1930s, people were thinking that the Piltdown Man, man skull might have actually been a forgery but it wasn't proven until 1951 he, he he wanted to leave it in the ground but he just 
he couldn't resist taking it out the ground. So he, he marks something there to show that this is where the bone came from. Um, so he left the bone in the safekeeping of a local chemist. He left a note begging the foreman not to dig the site away before more detailed examination and sent an urgent telegram to the British Museum. So that was on the 29th of <clears> June, 1935. He waited, wait for it, nine months, nine whole months. And it was now Sunday, the 15th of March, 1936. Having spent most of his weekends, um, hang on a minute, he waited nine, hang on, yeah, he went, he waited nine months to actually find another bit. Having spent most of his weekend searching near the same spot, but not at that spot and harboring some bitterness and frustration over the lack of, of official support for further investigation, Marston found another part of the skull, same skull, the left parietal, nine months later, exact uh, near the spot where he found the first bit of bone. So he waited nine months to dig at that spot. On the 15th of March, he'd worked everywhere else but he'd not dug at that spot for nine months. And it was at that spot nine months later that he found another bit of bone, which is absolutely amazing. So he's then spent the next 20 years with his son uh, excavating there and they built the little hut, but they found nothing. They found nothing more. But it was 20 years later that somebody else found another bit of bone. This was on the 30th of July, 1955. A John Weimer um discovered another bit of skull interestingly enough it was 80 feet away from the earlier discovery but it was part it was from the same skull so you had two bits of skull exactly at the same spot you had another bit of skull from this skull found 80 feet away by another chap by the name of john weimer so Unfortunately, this wasn't found uh, by Marston. This was found by somebody else. Although the skull is often colloquially called Swan's Command, the delicate muscle attachments suggest it was, in fact, a young woman, despite its thickness. We mentioned thickness. The inside of the skull reveals the shape and size of the brain, which are similar to those of modern humans. However, the proportions of the skull and a small depression near its base are features shared with the much um, later Neanderthals. It appears that the Swanscombe woman was both a descendant of Boxgrove man, who was a, um, uh, which was a um, Heidelbergensis, and a distant ancestor with the Neanderthals. So in other words, it was a half-breed already. <laughs> she came from one of the higher gravel horizons, rich in pointed axes, those pointed axes that we've been looking at. How she died, we do not know. Illness, disease, or childbirth are all possibilities, or perhaps she had too close an encounter with one of the lions or bears that roamed the landscape, fighting over the carcasses of a deer, maybe. So they found all these other bits of archaeological evidence there. And do you know what? I've just read that from an article uh, which is entitled Swanscombe... Hang on, if we... Um, if I go back and look at... Here we go. I think I pressed on that one. So if I go back there... So I typed in Swanscombe Skull. And what I'd like to do is share this image, is share the images of this chap with you. So, so we, we, we know the man, we know the man and his son. So if we go there and if we type in, let's just see the man. So if we, Swans, hang on, Swanscombe, hang on, stop it. Hang on a minute. Um, I, got that. I typed in Swanscombe Skull. And we've got a couple of nice images of the man himself, Marston. It's good to come close to this man. And if we type in, we go down there. And if we, if I think it's, I think it's that one there. Hang on a minute. There, that one. I think we've got nice little images. I don't know if this is the same one that I'm looking at, but we'll soon see. Oh God, it's not letting me do it. Oh my God. Um, oh, shame. And let's just see what we've got there. Oh, hang on a minute. Hang on. There it is. It's what I wanted. There it is. Oh, simplify the view. 
There he is. There's Marston. Um, there's Marston at Barnfield Pit in 1955. But Marston was not the discoverer of the other bit of skull that was found by Weimer. So if we go back to that there. So it was Weimer who made the other discovery on the 30th of July, 1955, but Marston was still working there. So Weimer had made the discovery, but Marston was still on site. So it was thanks to Marston's continued work over 20, 20 years that the other bit of skull was actually found by Weimer. Um, and if we if we look again, I think there's another image. There he is, Marston still excavating away. Yeah, Andy would be the ideal man for Claire. I can see it now. Yeah. Um, and there is it he, is. Was there he married? Was. Yes. Well, they, he had a, and he had a child. He was married. Yeah. Shut up, Andy. Um, and there you go. And and look at this here. With all the other archaeological evidence from the site, do you know what? Um, th this is another thing. I, I, I struggle with images like this, right? And the reason why I struggle with images like this, uh, if it's cold, surely they, it's not, it's not you know, I've got to be honest with you, um, human beings encountered the same cold conditions as us. Um, did they truly wander around completely stark naked? I, I've, I've always asked that question. Well, it was an oh. interglacial warm period, wasn't it? Yeah, but it wasn't as warm as today. Might have been. It as warm. Yeah, it wasn't as warm as today, as the descriptions. It, it said it was like, um, here we go, um, temperate, chilly, um, hunting band. Um, so it's very similar today, open grassy river plains, birch pine and alder forest. I tell you what, I tell you what, we'll do an experiment, Margaret, right? You, me and Drina will hang around in the woods at Silverdale, completely stark <laughs> naked, and let's see how long we last. <laughs> if the sun was out, they would burn, surely. <laughs> right, you, you, now we're starting to say the same things. So what I want us to do now... <coughs> I want us to mention a little bit more about this, um, our, our swans come, and then I, I want us to have a very, very tiny break. And then that, that'll be it then. So, so we've got the third fragment found by um, Weimer, and swans come is one of very few sites in Britain that we've got hominid remains older than 400,000 years ago. So we've got Boxgrove um, and I th have we got Packham, I think we have. And anyway, so it's a very, very rare site that we've got human remains date back to 400,000 years ago. And a final thing on the a final thing on this. So if we look at a the one of the mammoth teeth, um, and we go there. Look at that there. And that, love it. We, we love mammoth teeth. There we go. Um, so what, what we've got, further excavations carried out between 1968 and 1972. By Dr. Um, Weichter uncovered more animal bone and flint tools, such as mammoth teeth. And established the mm. extent of the former shoreline on which the bones are found. So in other words, it was like a gravel shoreline where the body was left. It may have even been buried. We don't know. Most of the bone finds are now in the Natural History Museum in London um, with the stone finds at the British Museum. And if anyone ever wants to go to that Natural History Museum, let me know because they will get a free pass in to see one of the exhibitions. Um, because um, as, as you know, um, I, I've helped with one of their displays. So there you go. So let me know. Um, and so obviously this site at Swanscombe is as important as Brixham, Kent, 
Cavern, Paveland, mm. Pont Newith, Goff, Dark Goffs Cave, Haysborough, uh, Pakefield. And what we're going to do, what we're going to do really is I want to have a five minute break and then we're going to um, just look at Pont Newith briefly and then we're going to call it a day because naturally um, I, I need to make tracks. Uh, Peter, you coming in the morning, Pete? Uh, oh, will you be there in the morning? I'll be there at 11 o'clock. Oh, 11 o'clock tomorrow. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to remind us we'll be doing some more Paleolithic stuff next week, and then we will move on to the Mesolithic period. Don't everybody don't don't forget your monies tonight, including uh, uh, Pete, because you know it, it takes a while for. If I tell Pete that he owes us money, right? He'll probably pay it in four weeks. Or so anyway, what's that, Pete? I said, or not at all. <gasps> oh my God, Margaret! What have I done? Have I insulted him too much? <laughs> right. Okay. I, what we're going to do? We're going to have. I, I want. Obviously, yeah. um, take, break. take my quick break and I'll be back now. Hmm. Take a break, take a break, take a kick. <laughs> right, I gotta do this, gotta do this. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, riding through the glen. Are we on the break now? Yeah. Oh, I'll go well. make a cuppa. Five <clears throat> <clears throat> minutes, hurry up. Oh, <laughs> Five minutes to do one more. Right, come on. I nipped out to feed the fish. I think these birds are going to be gone by next week. Okay. Yeah, they got their wings. They're shaking their wings. All right. He's in there at the moment covering them, but uh, <laughs> they're advancing so quickly. <laughs> Is it, isn't it a privilege to watch? I don't think watching yeah. these things it like that, it's a I privilege, it it a real privilege is. to see. It has yeah. given me so much in, oh, enjoyment just watching them, yeah. I can imagine. Absolutely. Watching them progress, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, because they're so early this year, is she likely to have a second brood? Mm -hmm. Because it happens. It does, yeah. Could have. And it is early this year. Mm. If they've flown the nest by next week, I mean that's just middle May. Mm. Um, yes, this could well time, isn't there, for another lot? She certainly could. Yep. Yeah. Whether she knackered after this eight, I mean, she's definitely been feeding eight. <laughs> <laughs> Has he been helping her? Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. 
Yes, he comes in with food for her. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And they pass it to one another and <laughs> then the, the, the chicks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they probably just want to rest. Go and sit on a bit of chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Mum and Dad. Usually it is. I can see them coming in and feeding off the fat balls and the peanuts. Yep. <laughs> and as she comes up, there's a, a little bracket up just outside my window and she comes up, she sits on there and looks at me. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, not not uh, but um, the, my neighbours have got these uh, white doves, a whole lot of them. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, they come and sit on my windowsill, and they're very nosy and they're looking. Yeah. They, and if I talk to them, I, it's amazing how animals respond. Oh yeah, if, if you talk, and these birds come fairly regularly and sit on the. I don't tell them the window because they're. <laughs> But they're very nosy. And again, I feel it's just the sort of privilege having anything to do with it, wild animals. Yeah. They trust I was out on Platon Island, I was walking around, and I came across a rabbit chewing on a dandelion leaf. Yeah. They looked at, it at me as if to say, you know, what are you doing here? This is my <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I said, hello, Peter. Well, I'm Peter too. And he looked at me and just carried on chewing on his leaf. <laughs> yeah. As if to say, oh, well, Go then. <laughs> Leave me alone. Give it's me all, a piece. It's all right. He won't. He won't scared you were going to do anything in that state. No, was he? he won't. He won't. <laughs> then, He's then, a bit worried. And that, and I think that's where one feels a privilege when animals will, yeah, don't run off and will, but yes, let you, you know, stay with them and talk to them a bit. It's and, like uh, the slow yeah. worms out there. Mm. You can pick up the slow worms, but because it's a cold, a cold blooded animal. It will absorb the heat from your hands. Mm -hmm. And I was over there. We had a, a blind man coming around. His wife was guarding, uh, guiding him around. Uh, I was a tour guide at the time. And I picked up the slow worm. I had the slow worm. And I said, well, do you, do you, would you like to feel? Of course, I'd love to feed it, he said. So I put <laughs> it in his hand. And he said, oh, this. Oh, this is absolutely amazing. He couldn't see it. Yeah. He could feel the beautiful, smooth mm -hmm. skin. And the yeah. fact that he was happy sitting in his hand, sitting hand, yeah, a, a wild animal. He was he, that was really yeah. made his day. And he said, "Oh, yeah. I haven't felt anything like this. This is absolutely wonderful." But there we yeah, are. It's, it's, it is. I certainly feel so. I mean, it doesn't yeah. happen all that often, but it does happen, doesn't it, from time yes. to time? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, I spent a long time with um, a squirrel once. You know, quite mm. close to it, and oh yeah, sort of. You know, I mean, obviously, you're being very still, and you know, yeah. but yeah, I was really. Well, I've got a pair that come into the garden, and I'm, <laughs> I made them a picnic, a picnic table. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I put a little bowl of nuts uh, that, on it. That would be a very good attraction for them. <laughs> I put a bowl of nuts on it, and they would come and take the bowl of nuts, sit on the picnic table, eating the nuts. <laughs> and to me, that was, <laughs> it was amazing to see the squirrels sitting on my picnic table, eating yeah. the nuts. Yeah. It is, it is it's lovely. I, I am a little bit daft. I, mem I remember once one of the most amazing things, because I used to do a lot of walking, and um, one of the amazing things that I ever saw was a grasshopper laying eggs. I, sort of, I stayed and watched it. It was really a special thing to see. You know, yeah. I really thought that was precious. Yeah, there's a, a lot of little precious things like that. that oh, yes. Absolutely. You know, they're, they're little things, but they. Yep. I remember once watching a, a bee that had got its wings wet and it was in one of these, there was a little rivulet by the side of the road and it was being swept along and obviously in distress with this. Then it managed to get on a twig. It was interesting watching the drama of it and how it managed to rescue itself. I mean, a little story almost. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the most fascinating things I watched for ages were ants um, oh, nice. just plodding along collecting a little leaf or a blade of grass yeah. and all marching along in a line yeah. sort of regimented <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I, I, I watched them for ages going yeah. backwards and forwards little yeah. worker ants yeah. building a nest mm. yeah it was fascinating and they were carrying bits of leaf that were almost bigger than themselves yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, to, to, to oh, get in touch with nature week. in that way is amazing. 
Mm. Last week you were talking about getting, you know, soft stuff for your birds in your in their nest. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm molt and I'm picking all this lovely soft hair up, and I thought mm. it's a pity I can't get it to you. Is this because it's <laughs> where you like, know, I, 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 I lose top. such a lot of hair, and I've got mm. long hair, you know. And it's, it's so soft when you... I could, I could like send it, you a bag full of my dogs. He's really yeah, mom, it, yes, and it's beautiful, right, soft dogs, and animals. downy. I, I had cut mine, and I put <laughs> it in a in a plastic case and yeah. hung it not far from the nest. And I could see her coming and picking... Yeah, you can take it, yeah. Taking it into the nest. Yeah. And I know if I can see, they've got my hair all around. Lovely, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, isn't Oh, yes. Really lovely. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> oh dear! And the most chatty animals I've found is goats. Goats mm -hmm. right. almost talk to you in a way. A lot of animals be interesting, but goats I think are of us are talkative, <laughs> even with people I don't know. <laughs> Hang on a minute. So, so you've actually got goats to talk to you? Almost. They're almost. You know, they're paying attention and making noises back. Yeah. It's you isn't quite, it isn't quite an understandable language, but it's... I don't know, I don't know. Pete's just made an allegation, it's true. So what's the problem? No, I didn't say it was a problem. No, well, OK, then. You know, Pete, Pete, sometimes when sheep have, have, have lost their fleece and it's cold, you've got to make sure that they're warm at night. Well, yes. Mm. I, I, I'm glad we agree. <clears throat> It's all gone. It's all. How how to kill off this conversation, Pete? I've just done it. Mm. So, uh, right, you here we go. And uh, hang on, mate. right. So I'm just gonna get it. I'm just gonna get this up there for. Uh, you know what? I tell you what, right? Um, I, 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 I just I'm just amazed um, with, uh, uh, with 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 um, oh god. Margaret's daughter. Oh. <laughs> she's meant to be here looking after me and she's just torn a ligament in her knee. Oh, so in oh. actual fact, I'm looking after her. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, how did she tear that ligament in her knee? She, well, she lives in Mallorca and she wanted to make a lemon pie. And you know that lemons grow in profusion over there all over the place. She'd climbed onto a wall to collect some lemons that were hanging over and she jumped off the wall and landed awkwardly and she's just torn. In fact, it, it's uh, cut it into the ligament in Ooh. the knee. Mm -hmm. So she can't really walk. She's not supposed to walk. Ooh. That's the type of thing Roger does, isn't it? Yeah. But she did have a nice lemon pie out of it. <laughs> did she? We had a yeah. beautiful campsite in southern Greece, and there I could reach out the door of the boat home and pick a lemon yeah. from fresh from the tree to have. Isn't with, that nice? With my cooking, yes. Oh yes. Yeah. I do well, love when a lemon. Go, when did you go there last, Pete? Oh, Greece! Oh Christ, that was ten. I was there with my wife, so that must have been oh twelve, twelve years ago, probably. Yeah. That's when we went to uh, Mycenae and saw the, the gate of Mycenae and Olympiad and... Ooh, happy days. And Delft and Parthenon, of course, and the uh, Poseidon's Temple. And saw the sun go down over Poseidon's Temple. Ah. Right, so, folks, folks, let, let's crack on now. Okay. So, is, is, this, is this actually showing on... Look at Claire, we're in her bedroom. I, well, I've been in Bickman's bedroom before, but uh, um, she just wanted to invite you into it. Cheeky. There's only people on at the moment, Carol. What's that? <laughs> there was only people, but now, now you're screen sharing. Got it. Oh, teeth. Oh, teeth. Teeth. Right, Pont Newith Cave is most famous They're for better teeth. teeth than I've got. Like, actually, that... that um, the, the, the teeth there uh, are, the, are the famous teeth from Pont Newith Cave. Um, and basically, 
it, it, it's a, a major site um, that's seen lots of archaeological work. And, and this sort of gives you an idea. It, it's a cave network within a network of valleys. Um, and this is the landscape that we're going to look at. So it's it's in northeast Wales. It's in um, it's in sort of northeast Wales. Um, and if you you've got to you've got to turn that um, there is north, so you've got to turn it completely around. So um, if you on the left hand side up there is going to be a bit further north is going to be Liverpool, and if you turn that the other way around, Snowdonia, Snowdonia, which is on the right hand side of the screen. Um, it's going to be naturally where um, over by where Gwynedd and Anglesey are going to be. So, so that, that that's completely the wrong way round. That gives you an idea. So, Pontnewid Paleolithic site, also known, um, it's known as Pontnewid than Pontnewid. Uh, it's a major archaeological site. It's a major archaeological site in regards to Paleolithic archaeology, and it's it's one of those sites that ranks alongside the amazing remains at Swanscombe and Boxgrove. And it's classically known for the remains of um, its Neanderthals and, and the teeth relating to those Neanderthals. Um, so if we, this is what it looks like today. It was used as um, an ammunition store um, in the Second World War. Um, you know, it, it, it's, this is why it, it looks like this. And it, it's one of those protected caves. And basically, it's got um, um, torodontal disease associated with the teeth. They, they, they've expanded. They've got larger root system, um, which is a typical characteristic of Neanderthals. And I know we've mentioned this before, but I just wanted to a little bit of an overview um, and then we'll call it a night. So it was we, we material has been found in this cave over time. But in 1978, uh, the very eminent Dr. Um, Stephen Alderhouse Green um, found some teeth which were part of a jawbone from a Neanderthal boy um, that was approximately 11 years old and dates back to 230,000 years ago. <clears throat> so put her in that category. So if we look at the evidence that we've just looked at in connection with Swanscombe being 400,000 years old and we look at Botsgrove being... Um, 500,000 years old, this 230,000 years old teeth um, are very remarkable. So 17 teeth have been found in total from at least five individuals. So, so not just that one of the teeth, but we've got 17 sets of teeth found within these caves. And naturally it's, it's changed since because it's been used um, it was used in the last war as a shelter for our ammunition. And that sort of gives you an idea. That's where Pont Newark Caves are to be found. So sort of <coughs> north, east of there is going to live, be Liverpool. There's the Pont Newark. Um, and amazing enough, we can see that that's associated uh, with Carboniferous Rock. So it's a Carboniferous Rock out, um, upland. And it may seem that I'm rushing this bit tonight, but we have actually looked at Pont Newid before. So it's just an overview because we're doing the Paleolithic stuff. The teeth show evidence of torodontism, uh, which basically is where you've got enlarged pulp cavities, um, where basically the, the teeth um, are a bit wider, but interestingly enough, have shorter root systems. So if we, if we look at that X-ray, so what we've got, we, we, the, the, the teeth roots are wider, but they're actually shorter root, root systems. Um, and it's sort of a larger sort of pulp cavity within, if you can sort of look at the x-ray. And this is, this is not unique to Neanderthals, but can be invi invited as, as a Neanderthal straight. that is quite common to the Neanderthal um, <clears throat> sort of, you know, genus as a more pure breed uh, before it's sort of sort of interbreed as we sort of mentioned earlier on um and what what has been found as well um what 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 we do know is that the the teeth um have been found alongside um, a wolf species um that seemingly 
uh, lived at the same time as the Neanderthal species were using the cave as well. And, the, and what we've got, we've got dating evidence from um, from the hominids, the, the Neanderthal hominids within the cave a system at Pont Neuf, and we've got evidence of wolf, um, the, the canis, um, the, the, the genus of, of canis, the wolf, which is um, present in Pont Neuf. Um, it's also it's also famous for woolly rama, mammoth um, remains and woolly rhinoceros remains and the remains of reindeer. And we've got evidence dating not only from 243,000 years ago and, and the bone evidence of these Neanderthals and their teeth dating back to 230,000 years ago, but we've also got dating evidence going into a period that's similar to when people were using the cave system at Kent's Cavern and using the cave systems on the Gower over 40,000 years ago. So I just wanted to chuck that in there. And what we're going to do, we do, I do believe if we look at the other images, finally, hang on a minute. Um, if we do that, hang on, we go to this here. No, that swan's coming on a minute. If we go back to the images and we don't do that um and there's lots of images up here if you type in pont new is um and hang on a minute uh what do we do oh this is something we don't come across let's look, have a look at that image there a minute um again another one of the teeth can you see how wide these teeth are look at that so we've got we've got um in in order in order to understand this we've got uh, 17 um, teeth all together from, from it said, five different individuals. And we've got stone tools, um, typical typifying Neanderthal stone tools. There they go. More more church stone tools. Um, again, another image of Pont Neuf, and that gives you an idea of the scale. So what we're going to do, we're just going to have a look at this plan, um, and then we're going to call it a day. Everyone loves a good old plan of a cave. So what, we, what we've got, this gives a bit of an idea, doesn't it? So we've got this here where there it was used in the Second World War. And it's quite a simple cave system. But obviously lots of this has been eroded away. And they've created, um, it said that you've got, that's interesting, let's see, read what that says there. It says a new passage was excavated um, from within the cave towards the surface, where a large scale excavation uncovered a new, a new entrance at a depth of several meters below ground level. The entrance was backfilled at the end of the project, and this is dating back to 1978 and the excavations there. So what we're going to do, we're going to call that a night, um, more or less ending close to 930 more about the Paleolithic period next week, but I did say I would be ending it this week, the Paleolithic wise, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do some sort of loose ends. We'll go to Gibraltar, Romania. We're going to be doing some foreign stuff next week. There's another cave site that I want to look at in this country. So um, we, we, will, we will look at that and that will bring our Paleolithic work to an end next week. So that's what we're going to do. I'll have the proper slideshow next next week. It's been a bit of a um, it's been a bit of a mixed bag today, but that's fine. It worked very well. So let's see if there's any questions. Uh, Margaret looks upset. I don't know why. Well, Margaret, just... you look very you look very pensive, Margaret. It's almost as if uh, yeah, some... um, my eyesight's not very good. I haven't got my specs, <clears throat> so everybody looks a bit blurred. Um, I've got a very good book, actually, The Archaeology of Britain, and it, there's a chart in it that uh, a Paleolithic chronology and lithic technologies, and it lists, it's really very interesting, and it shows the Pont Nuid cave is during the Averley interglacial 230,000 years ago, and the technology was hand axes and level wire blades. Level what? Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah. We're Ooh. going to try and put some of this in our chart. Yeah. 
Yeah, but it's and it and it mentions Swanscombe four hundred thousand years ago, during the Hoxnian interglacial and about the hand axes, etc. So it's very good. Thank you very much for that. And um, so, what what we need to do now is is ask if there's anything from Claire. Do you know what? This is the first time Claire's ever uh, ever sat in on a full class. It's almost <laughs> as if she's happy with life now. <laughs> <laughs> Anything from you, Claire? Um, I am curious about one thing. When you said um, different tribes intermingled, would they have um, transferred their skills to each other, learned from each other? Now, this this is this is one thing. This is one thing that we were saying last week. The answer is yes, but that's not necessarily important. What is important is. Is, is seeing the survival of human groups. The point I was trying to make was that when you've got a human group isolated, it evolves to yeah. uh, bring on the characteristics that um, humanity evolved to. You don't necessarily need human interaction um, to develop skills, but having human interaction is, is quite important. So yes, so, so the answer is yes. But it's not the be all and end all. The be all and end all is actually making sure that your um, gene pool continually sort of evolves. That's the point I was trying to make. Yeah, uh, I understand that. I was just curious myself. Yeah, no, it's it, the answer is yes, but not as important as a gene pool thing. Oh no, yeah. Be because to be honest with you, if um, mm. uh, if you if uh, if you if you if you've got a group of human beings and they're forced to survive, they will survive. Yeah. Right. Um, but they can't continue to survive unless they meet other human groups. So you yeah. can see what's more important there. Yeah. But they must have had a behavioural influence on one another, mustn't they? Oh yeah. Well, that, that's another that's another level altogether, isn't it? So yeah. I suppose really sharing skills and things are. Help, Thank you, their, help their survival to some yeah. extent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would it would have. What it would have. I, I'm not discounting any of that. I'm 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 agreeing with you, but what All I'm right. saying is is that there are other factors that allow humanity to continue. Yeah. That 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 that's where that's where we're at. That that's the bat we're 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 fielding. So thanks, yeah. Claire and Margaret. If you haven't got anything else to say, anything you'd like to say, Anne? No, no thanks. And <laughs> no, no, thank you. Uh, uh, Roger, um, anything you'd like to say, darling? Yes, there is something I've often wondered, and maybe something nothing, but with the mixed uh, genes, I'm thinking of the uh, special mixes that come on and that sort of thing. Like can't hear you, Roger. Can't hear. Oh. Roger, you're muffled. Yeah, I'm pulling the phone. Oh. Go for it. Go for it now. I've got the monitor off. <laughs> I've got it off. I'm sure you can hear them. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, is that the features of the Aboriginal tribes with their facial features thing? Possibly, is it? It seemed to be a, a bit like the uh, Neanderthal type of feature with nose, cheeks. Whether yeah. there's any link, a stronger element of that, I don't know. I'm just often wonder. Now, th this, this, this is the bigger problem. Th this this yeah. is the problem. Um, when we did the Neanderthal, wh when we did um, Aboriginals, yeah. um, the problem trying to understand Aboriginals is where the original Aboriginal um type of hominid in Australia actually developed from. Um, and we would think that there are similarities between um Homo sapiens Neanderthals and yeah. current day living current day living um ab aboriginals. However, it may have just been an adaptational um way humans would go, not necessarily um, more DNA from Neanderthals. It's just the way hominids develop for, for and around different conditions. Yes, it's just a thought. I thought, well, 
it may be uh, just a sort of similarity, it's too slim. But I've often wondered, because of this mix, how much uh, the mix could vary between one race, part of the world, and another. And is there something in that? But that's... that's I, 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 I don't... I would say yes, and I would say no at the same time. It do, it doesn't. <clears throat> the main the main the main point is is that where whatever we've done, we we have evolved to create where we are today, and that is the that is the most important thing. That's what I've been getting across. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks for that, Rog. Um, anything right. from you, Pete? No, not really. No, just a. a the, uh, the Aboriginals in, in Australia, they would have been isolated for some time yes. in Australia before uh, the immigrants got there. Yes. Yeah, no, yeah, no, that, that's a good point. Um, Andy? No, I'm good, thank you. Interesting stuff. Thank you very much. And what about you, Pat? Oh, these numbers are mind-boggling, you know, 300,000 years, and you can't even... How do you imagine that, you know? And no, uh, you you can't. I looked up uh, Lucy and, you know, Lucy the, the, you know, in Africa, and they said that was 3.2 million years oh. ago. So, yes, and, yeah. and the, the, the older boy footprints were 3.7. So, yeah, they, they, they're for me. Yeah, so. Unbelievable. The, the, oh, and one other the, the, thing, I, I really liked your description of the people who were facing the flood in Doggerland. Oh yes, made it come to life. So mm. What what year was that? How many years ago? It's, it's quite dramatic. Awesome. Eight thousand five hundred years ago. Yeah. <clears throat> How many? Eight thousand eight, 8, eight thousand five hundred years okay. ago. Right. And, and as I as I say, whether it was eight thousand five hundred years ago on the fourteenth of October or <laughs> eight thousand six hundred fifty three years ago, the date is is not relevant. The 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 occurrence of the data and what happened is more important. Yeah. Not the date. The date should never be a, important. I didn't know we had Neanderthal caves here in Wales, so that's uh, new, new to me. Quite new, quite new, yeah. And yeah. when you think about it, all the caves that we've looked at, other than the ones on the Gower, have seemingly got massive Neanderthal evidence. Uh. So, Andy, anything from you? Uh, no, thank you. No, that's good, thanks. Good. Just a good from Andy. That's good. I, I, I like that. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to go to David. So we're going to say goodbye to David before we ask him, because we know he's going to go. Don't forget, everybody. Hi, Dave. David. Uh, Hi, David. David. Hi, Dave. Oh, David. Oh, David. Say something, Dave. He can't. He's muted. Just Dave, you're goodbye. muted. Okay. Dave, Dave, you're muted. We can't hear Dave. Where's Dave? Dave, say something, Dave. What I think he's muted? having electricity cut. Oh, oh, there he is. <laughs> there he is. Oh, oh my God. And the Dave's still there. Yeah, he, done. Oh, he oh. went off again. Oh, he's bye, bye. Bye. Bye, 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 David. Bye. Where are you are? Bye, Dave. Oh, it's, it's, it's what me and Roger used to do in the minibus. We used to shout out the window. Right, John. Yeah, I still do. I mean, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Do, you think there's another, do you think there's another unknown species walking amongst us that we don't know about <laughs> that we're yet to mate with? Yeah, yeah they're from Barry. <laughs> say that. The, the other day, the other day, I was invited to church with uh, this lady I met, who believes life only started about 5000 years ago oh, and it's a bit say. it's a bit hard to know how to talk to somebody like that isn't it i have a friend mm. just like that <laughs> california <laughs> yeah we, 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 we won't we won't go down that avenue we just never happened <laughs> yeah that's in the so, jewish bible so that's on you yeah so my uh, grandson right, who's so, a geologist he was following a group into the uh, Natural History Museum in uh, London, and they came across the big dinosaur. Yeah. And the children turned around to their American parents and said, oh, how old is that, Dad? And he said, well, he can only be about 6,000. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it was well, they've got American, this museum, haven't they? They've got a museum somewhere in, I can't yeah. remember where America it is. 
where they've got humans and dinosaurs in the you chose because it's only five thousand years ago. <laughs> and if they believe in dinosaurs at all, they've got to be in this museum. Yeah. And I thought, well, I don't know. It's kind of... <laughs> there we are. So they're all, all going to get educated there. <laughs> well, 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 it could be worse. Anyway, um, is there anyone want to say anything else before we 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 go? Drina, Margaret, Anne, Roger, Claire. No. Um, Peter, Andy, Pat, anything else? No. No, thanks. No. Okay, well, I'm going to say good night to you. I'll hopefully see you all next Tuesday. Have um, a good thanks journey. For yeah. support. Uh, Pat, Andy, Peter, uh, Roger, and Margaret. Yeah. Are I might not and, be here uh, for okay. the next two weeks. You will be, be here. I might not be here for the next two weeks. Oh, well, that you've ruined my day already, and Roger has. <laughs> yeah. I'll try my best, but I don't think I will be. Okay then. Well, we're we're gonna miss you, and we're, we we'll miss Rog as well. I I won't. I'll have to start insulting Pete. What time well, do you say tomorrow, Carl? Eleven o'clock. Eleven o'clock. Okay. Yeah, eleven o'clock. Okay then. Well, I'm gonna say good night. So I'll see yes, you all soon. Good night. 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 Thanks, Carl. Good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 Take care, lovelies. See you, Anne, and whoever else. Right, I'm off. So whoever's still watching, thank you very much. And don't forget to like and subscribe on um, uh, YouTube. I nearly forgot what it was. <laughs> and we can hear you, Margaret. No, we can't. You're not there anymore. Anyway, we're going to end. Bye. And Anne, I'll see you soon. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Not live.